Hi, I'm Tina Coleman, the Regional Dairy Educator for University of Wisconsin Division of Extension, and here today to talk a little bit about lameness, more specifically in the heifer herd. And when we think about lameness, we really are looking at the milking herd, but really when we think about it, many of the lameness issues can trace back to when she was a heifer in the heifer pens. When we're looking at lameness detection in lame animals, a 2017 USDA National Animal Health Monitoring System survey showed that when asked if they detected lameness or lame animals within the herd, 89.7% of all herds indicated that they observed lameness and lame animals in the milking herd, but only 55.2% of the operations surveyed reported it or looked at lameness detection in lame animals in the heifer herd, more specifically with the breeding heifers. When we look across by herd size, smaller operations looked at lameness in lame animals less than our larger operations. But when we look across the cows versus the breeding heifers, there's even less farms looking for lameness or lame animals when it comes to the bred heifers. Now we look at the average percent lame cattle on operations. We see that the reported operations have about 16.8% of lame cattle reported on their operations when it was in the milking herd, but only 3.2% of the bred heifers were reported to have lameness. Now this may show that is this a true number when it comes to our heifer herd or not, as we know that less heifers are being observed for lameness in lame animals. So 3.2% lameness may not be a true number because we're not fully detecting lameness or lame animals in the heifer herd. But is heifer lameness a problem? Again, looking at the 2017 USDA NOMS data, we are looking at bred heifers versus cows. And when we look at bred heifers in digital dermatitis, or commonly known as hairy heel warts, that all operations, 70.9% had reported digital dermatitis as their cause of lameness in the bred heifers. Versus when we're looking at foot rot across all operations, only about 16.7% of all lameness cases with the bred heifers are reported back to foot rot. When we look at digital dermatitis in the milking herd, 36% of the lameness cases across all operations were reported to be digital dermatitis, while 16.9% were reported to be foot rot. So is lameness a problem in the heifer herd? When we're looking at all operations, 70.9% of their lameness issues is digital dermatitis or hairy heel warts. Looking at a 2016 data from the University of Wisconsin Extension Dairy Program area, they surveyed about 45 herds here in Eastern Wisconsin about hoof health practices. And when we looked at heifer hoof health practices, we see of the 45 herds that about 26 of those herds never used a foot bath within the heifer herd. And if they did use a foot bath, the frequency was maybe one of them used quarterly, two used it monthly, and maybe three to four used it weekly. But a majority of the herds, again, never used a foot bath with the replacement herd. Now, if we're looking at frequency of hoof trimming across 45 herds, about 13 of those herds said never tr trimmed hooves in the heifer herd. And then about 18 of them trimmed as needed, while only eight of the operations said that they had a scheduled routine for all of their heifers to be trimmed. A large number still never trimmed or only trimmed on an as-need basis the selected heifers that needed it. So we're talking about hoof health in the heifer herd. We wanna think about the heifer in general, providing the healthiest start that we can to get her into the milking herd to pay back some of her daycare fees, as we call it, her rearing costs. And only do that is to get her in the milking string and into a couple of lactations to help pay off those expenses. But when we're looking at hoof health, we wanna think about nutrition management, digital dermatitis prevention, transition management from 
the from the heifer herd to the milking herd, and some housing issues that can, can account for hoof health issues. So looking at nutrition management, starting off there is we know that we need a heifer that is strong, productive, and profitable. And when we say productive, we're talking about growing. Since hooves are composed of primarily proteins and fats, nutrition plays a major role in hoof health. We need to make sure we have adequate levels of nutrition so that we can build a strong hoof or wheels for that animal to walk. And we wanna keep those hooves healthy by various mechanisms. Now, again, since hooves and again, since hooves are made predominantly of fats and proteins, nutrition plays a major factor in hoof health and hoof development. And it is obvious that animals must have adequate levels of both crude protein and fatty acids to make sure we have good health. Now, fermentable carbohydrates should be used in limited amounts in cattle because of the rumen microbes that produce lactic acid and increase the pH then becomes reduced. Now, as that pH in the rumen is reduced, we have endotoxins that are produced, which then releases histamines. These histamines cause vasoconstriction, dilation, laminar destruction, and hoof deterioration, and the laminitis process develops. So a rapid diet change can have a shift in the rumen microbes and the rumen pH, which can lead to laminitis. So again, providing adequate levels of fermentable carbohydrates not to exceed to cause laminitis, to make sure we have enough feed buck space so that we're not slug feeding and giving an opportunity for pH to change in the, in the rumen are key factors in helping to reduce laminitis acidosis. We want to be able to use limited amounts of those carbohydrates so that we can make sure that the pH remains steady throughout her day in the rumen. We also want to help make sure that the animals, by using continuous access to low energy forages, feel satisfied when they eat, so they're not slug feeding throughout. We also want to make sure we have adequate trace minerals and vitamins, including copper, zinc, vitamin A, vitamin B, E, and biotin, because these also play a major role in healthy hoof development. When we think of calcium, it helps to activate those enzymes to form keratin, which is the principal building blocks of hooves. Vitamin A and biotin help with growth and waterproofing of those hooves. We also know that zinc helps with hoof growth and maintenance, while copper helps to strengthen and harden those hooves. So using and making sure that we provide good, clean feed with adequate nutrition is key in helping to maintain a good, healthy hoof. And as always, consult with your nutrition to nutritionist to help meet those nutritional needs of those heifers so that we are having a growthy, productive heifer. When we talk about limit feeding, we're talking about really it's about precision feeding. Limit feeding is not limiting necessarily the heifer's nutrition, but the volume she's eating and that we can give less forages, but still have an energy nutrient dense diet. So making sure that we're not just cutting back forages and feed, but we're maintaining the adequate levels of nutrition that she needs. When we limit feed or precision feed these heifers, we need to be able to weigh these heifers often to make sure they're growing at adequate levels and that we want to maintain a group with less than 200 pounds of variation. When we have greater variation in weight range, we have older heifers that are bullying younger heifers at the bunk or even heavier ones versus lighter ones and consuming more of the feed. We want to make sure there's 14 to 24 inches of bunk space so that all heifers have access to the feed bunk at all times. When we're doing limit feeding, we want to avoid the use of straw and shavings as bedding because if the heifer will then start consuming those type of materials to help maintain in her room and full and satisfied. But again, then we need to start worrying about the pH level and the micro population in the room and which could eventually uh, disrupt the population which decreases pH and then starts the laminitis process. And with precision feeding, we need to make sure that 
feed is pushed up often so that the heifers are not reaching out to go reach for feed, but they have access at all times and also prevents the slug feeding again. Long time, long time in between the time the feed is pushed up means an empty bunk and again could cause slug feeding. Next, we'll talk about digital dermatitis prevention within our heifer herd. As we showed earlier in the USDA NOMS data, 70% of lameness cases within the heifer herd were reported by all operations to be digital dermatitis as compared to foot rot. So digital dermatitis is something that is not curable, but it is preventable as well as maintainable to prevent it being bred into the milking herd later when she is older. So when we look at heifer digital dermatitis in first lactation heifers, we're looking at cases of whether they had no digital dermatitis before calving, one case of digital dermatitis, or two or more cases of digital dermatitis before calving. So this is research based out of University of Wisconsin School of Veterinary Medicine with Arturo Gomez in 2015. And when we see that we have two or more cases of digital dermatitis before calving, 9.6% of those heifers were called before 60 days. If they had one case of digital dermatitis before calving, 8.1 of a percent heifers was called. And then if there was no digital dermatitis before calving, 7.6% of those heifers were called before 60 days. Now, when we look at fresh cow health, we see that fresh cow health, 61.3% of the heifers were considered healthy if they did not have digital dermatitis before calving, but then decreased down to 56% if they had one or more cases of digital dermatitis before calving. DAs, there is no significance here, but we see a trend for increased percentages of DAs and heifers at 6.4% with two or more cases of digital dermatitis, as well as 3.2% of the heifers having two or more cases of digital dermatitis have ketosis. 30.4% of those heifers with two or more cases of digital dermatitis had mastitis, and we also saw a trend for increased respiratory disease at 7.2% of those heifers, again, with two or more cases of digital dermatitis. Again, no significance here, but we could see trends that the more cases of digital dermatitis that they've had before calving while they were in the heifer herd increases their issues with DA, ketosis, mastitis, or even respiratory disease. When we look at heifer digital dermatitis and their first lactation hoof health, we're looking again at no digital dermatitis before calving and one or two and more digital cases of digital dermatitis before calving. And when we look at locomotion score of greater than two on a four point scale, we could see that there really wasn't less than half percent of the heifers had a locomotion score of greater than two when there was no digital dermatitis in the uh, before calving but increased to 8.1% of those heifers having a locomotion score over two when there's two or more cases of digital dermatitis before calving. Again, we see trends, no significance, but do see trends as digital dermatitis events during the first lactation increased as incidences during their heifer rearing phases increased. 13.7% of those heifers had digital dermatitis in the first lactation, didn't have it before calving, but we saw that they had 45.6% of heifers with digital dermatitis in the first lactation had at least one case during their rearing phase and increases to 67.6% .6 of the heifers that had two or more cases of digital dermatitis during the rearing phase saw digital dermatitis in their first lactation. And we also see that the first event of digital dermatitis actually decreased in the days of milk we really didn't see digital dermatitis in those heifers that didn't have it before calving. Their first event, we saw about 244 days on average. But when we had heifers that had two or more cases of digital dermatitis before calving, their first case during their first lactation was at 169 days in milk. So we know based on research again by our Arterio Gomez, is that digital dermatitis in heifers leads to increased digital dermatitis events during first lactation. 
So when we look at first lactation, again, we're looking at no cases of digital dermatitis before calving, one case of digital dermatitis before calving, and two or more cases before calving. And that we see that before calving, uh, with no cases of digital dermatitis, that 90, almost 90% of our heifers did not have digital dermatitis in their first lactation, as compared to 68% and 36% of our heifers did not have digital dermatitis if they had it during their heifer rearing phase. So it decreased the amount of heifers that had an event during their first lactation. But as we see in the green bar, that how many incidences of digital dermatitis through their first lactation actually increased as they had more cases during their heifer rearing phases. So when we're looking up here, about 18 of those animals and 42 of those animals had digital dermatitis. More animals had digital dermatitis during first lactation when they had multiple cases of digital dermatitis during their heifer rearing phase. So what can we do to prevent digital dermatitis? And again, as we had mentioned earlier, that it is a highly contagious disease that is not treatable. It is preventable and it is also manageable. But how can we prevent digital dermatitis in the milking herd? Well, one thing is to observe and record in the heifer herd when we see cases of digital dermatitis. Because if we see one active case, there's probably more heifers that are having digital dermatitis because they're exposed to it by their pen mates. So to determine where the start of digital dermatitis is within your heifer herd, start with the oldest heifer pen and start working backwards to see where active lesions, the most active lesions occur at what age. If you determine if it's at a certain age that they show active lesions, count about 60 to 90 days and look at that age of heifer group. So that is where they're exposed to digital dermatitis, even though they're not showing clinical symptoms of that raw red lesion that's at the bottom of their foot, but that they're exposed to it by the nature of their environment. And we're starting to see symptoms 60 to 90 days later. So once we know where it starts, we can then start putting preventive measures like control foot baths to help their feet prevent digital dermatitis, which then will help reduce the spread of it in the heifer herd and then later in the milking herd. Now, if we do have digital dermatitis and we want to treat it, we want to treat with the appropriate product for one day. It only needs to be one day exposure to that lesion. And the key is heifers are difficult, but we want to wrap them with what's called a bikini wrap. So it's a light wrap just once around the foot starting in between the toes and wrapping around the foot and the heel with the gauze against the lesion with the tetracycline powder. The key there is that wrap needs to come off within one day or 24 hours later because that wrap can then later become a warm, moist environment for bacteria to continue to grow with manure maybe trapped in it after some time and be a happy medium and environment for bacteria to continue growing, causing more damage than curing. So again, even though it's heifers and heifers are a little bit difficult to treat, we have to really consider how we're going to treat them with the appropriate product. And again, working with your veterinarian through a veterinary client patient relationship, what treatment you would use. But again, the treatment would only be for about a 24 hour period using a product like tetracycline against the lesion. When we think about transition management, we're thinking about the heifer, leaving the heifer pen and going and transitioning into the milking herd. And there's some key things that we can do from an environment perspective to help make that transition ease. So when we're thinking about transition management, flooring is crucial. Do they have a similar type flooring from the heifer herd to the milking stream? If they don't, we wanna make sure to expose those close up heifers to concrete at least two months prior to the calving in. We also want to make sure that we avoid commingling of heifers and cows. Again, that goes back to the slug feeding and access to the feed bunk when we are mixing heifers and cows together pre and post fresh, which again, changes the micro population and the rumen pH, which could lead to laminitis. So we wanna make sure that with avoid commingling of heifers and have a heifer pen versus a cow pen pre and post fresh, if that's possible. Looking at housing though, we wanna think about housing as a clean, dry environment 
because the bacteria that causes digital dermatitis more specifically uh, loves wet, warm, moisture environments. But also when we're thinking about hoof health, not just digital dermatitis, but functionality of the hoof, we also wanna make sure there's adequate stocking density and flooring because pressure and stress can do a lot of harm to the hooves of our heifers. So here, based on work with Dr. Nigel Cook at the University of Wisconsin School of Veterinary Medicine, we have an issue that we've seen here more recently in our heifer herd, this rear medial claw corkscrew deformity, or as we commonly call it on the farm, reverse corkscrew. And this is issued not by bacteria or pathogens, but it's with the environment that the animal is feeding and being managed in. We see reverse corkscrew in these heifers with increased wear of those hooves, but not necessarily overgrowth of the hoof. We see this in breeding age heifers and older, and that's when we first start noticing it. And what happens is that medial claw, that inner claw, as you can see in this image here, takes on more weight than the outer claw and starts to twist. This causes a permanent skeletal change to the hoof and becomes a lameness issue down the road. So mainly when we think about reverse corkscrew, unlike digital dermatitis, which may affects mainly the rear feet, reverse corkscrew affects the front feet. And we can see that with shifting of weight from the rear feet to the front feet. And we can see that with splaying of the digits as a case in this picture here provided by Dr. Nigel Cook. And the theory behind this, again, another example of a reverse corkscrew in this image here, that inner medial claw, is pressure and stress. It's a growth wear issue, not an overgrowth of the hoof, but actual growth wear. And we see this from abnormal stress on the skeleton while eating. So what is associated risk for corkscrew claw syndrome? Well, heifer inventories. Again, if we're overstocking heifers, heifers having to compete at the feed bunk, overstocking can cause reverse corkscrew as they're pushing themselves, putting stress on those front hooves to get to the feed bunk. Use of sand bedding has been shown to have an increased risk of reverse corkscrew. And using bedded packs, if possible, is a better atmosphere for those calves. Headlocks for handling, again, because we're putting pressure on the front feet or access to the feed bunk. And again, pressure and stress is key. Many of our limit feeding strategies are associated risks because if we're not doing it properly, again, the, the heifer is reaching for feed when it needs to be pushed up. She's competing against the feed bunk if she doesn't have access to the feed bunk. And also hoof trimming practices, depending on whether or not you have a regular scheduled hoof trimming protocol in place or if you're doing it as needed. So to help minimize the effect of reverse corkscrew, again by Dr. Nigel Cook, is to think about reducing stocking density, which is easier said than done. We want to have these heifers to have access to the feed bunk so that they're not putting a lot of stress on their front hooves when they're eating. Utilize bedded packs. Understanding that stalls help uh, index and allow you to put more animals in the same amount of space, but utilizing bedded packs or even getting them out on dirt lots will help with their hoof health. And as with bedded packs, you could use deep bedded manure solids to help with maintaining that cushion for those hooves. Limit use of headlocks and cover grooved floors with rubber. Uh, some of the groove floors can be so grooved that heifers are actually putting more stress and pressure on those inner claws as they're walking across the, the grooved floors. And extend the ration, push up often, and again, reducing competition at the feed bunt so that she's not pushing to reach feed, not pushing to against the feed logs or competing with others, which causes that stress and pressure on her front feet. So again, when we're thinking about heifers, we want to give them the, the healthiest start possible so we can get them in the milking herd, but yet we need to make sure they can walk and be able to do that in a way to have longevity. So looking at hoof health in general, we want to make sure we have good proper nutritional management, reducing incidences of laminitis from slug feeding, room and pH changes, but also we want to make sure we have good nutrition with our vitamins and trace minerals to have a healthy, strong hoof that will last that heifer. 
We want to prevent digital dermatitis, which is a, a huge impact in the heifer herd reported in the NOMS data that 70% of all cases of lameness issues are contributed to digital dermatitis. And as we see, the increased risk of having digital dermatitis in the milking herd starts with how many times they had it in the heifer herd. And transition management from the heifer herd to the milking stream, as well as housing provided for the heifers, all have a key factor, and not only from a transition of those hooves, but also from the stress and pressure in preserving their hoof integrity so that she has long-lasting legs. So again, thinking about lameness in your herd, think about the heifers, where it starts looking at those heifers, determining when the cases of digital dermatitis or reverse corkscrew occurs in the herd, and then working backwards 60 to 90 days to put in preventative processes in place so that we can have good, strong, growing heifers entering the milking stream.